Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online Sunday service. It's great to have you with us. My welcome, as always, is twofold. Firstly, if Ebenezer Church is your church and you come along regularly, then a welcome to you. But a special welcome always to anyone who's just visiting, just having a look in at who we are, what we do, then you are extremely welcome here today. I was going to ask you whether you had remembered to change your clocks last night, but actually this is an online service, so it probably doesn't matter too much whether you were an hour early or an hour late, whatever the case would have been, with clocks going back an hour last night. Now I want to mention a couple of things coming up, uh, but just to give you due warning around today's service, we are having a live communion on Zoom immediately after the recorded service itself. So now if you haven't already done so, it would be a good time to grab yourself something to represent bread and wine. Uh, if you'd like to join us for communion Zoom afterwards, we'd love to have you with us. Just a couple of things to draw your attention to. One, you may be aware of that around this time of year, we'd normally be running a messy church from the church building, but of course we can't do that right now. So we're doing messy church a little bit differently this time round, And we're making the offer of half-term activity packs, which you can sign up to receive either in person, we might deliver it to you at your door, or you can download the pack online. But if you do want us to deliver the pack to you, you're going to have to sign up fairly quickly because this is a half-term pack and half-term will soon be over. Uh, but we'd love you to just, uh, just sign up. We're, it'd be great to have your involvement with Messy Church, something for the children to do over the half-term break. Um, now, if you do live outside of Hallfield, Lockleys or Filton, we can't guarantee to deliver the pack to you, but certainly you can download it. The second thing I wanted to mention to you was on Sunday, the 1st of November, at 8 o'clock in the evening, there is an interactive online chat show. It's uh, Speak Honestly by Kintsugi Hope, and this Sunday, it's tackling the subject of anxiety. And basically, it's signing up, and you can do that online or give us a call at the office uh, for details. You can sign up for the presentation itself, and then afterwards, it's just joining other local people for a chat. And it's to reflect on what you've heard, it's to chat about those very issues. So if you would like to do that, it's a great way of, of helping one another, supporting one another, especially concerning our well-being. If you don't really want to join in with the chat afterwards, you can actually still see the presentation. So once again, visit our website and sign up for that. It'd be great to see you on that occasion if you can. Now, today we've got Esther a little bit later on, just talking to us a little bit more about the 40 days of prayer. I'm excited about that. I hope you are too. Just a little bit more information today for you about that. And afterwards, Ben Whitnell will be speaking. But right now, we're going to take some time to worship together. So I'm going to hand over to Stuart, who's going to help us to do that just now. Good morning, everyone. We're going to um, use some songs to worship God this morning. We're going to use songs that are focusing on the faithfulness and goodness of God. So I just want to encourage you, wherever you are, whether you're in this building, uh, whether you're at home, um, to, if you're at home, maybe in the chat on Facebook or on YouTube, write something about that is impacting you right now about the faithfulness and goodness of God. If you're in this building, maybe chat to somebody um, who's two meters away um, from you and just kind of just say, what is it about the faithfulness of goodness of God that is impacting you right now? And we're going to sing into that. We're going to press into that this morning. So just take a minute. Father God, I pray for each one of us, wherever we're at, 
that you would unlock something deeper about your faithfulness and your goodness. Would you do that wherever we're at right now? For those who are watching who are at home and, and don't even know you, God, would you unlock something deep in their hearts about the faithfulness and the goodness of God that would turn their worlds upside down? Lord, we worship you. We declare who you are. And we press into what you have for us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great your faithfulness, O oh God, my Father, O oh God, my Father, your love is
Trusting in your cross, trusting in your blood, and all your faithfulness for your power and work in me is changing me. Thank you, Lord. It's changing me. Press into a change. Come, Holy Spirit. Break through. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God. I love you, Lord. And your mercy never fails. You have been f a i t h f u l
in our hearts, in our heads. Lord, that, that journey to continue declaring your goodness in every step. And Lord, where we find that really tough, thank you that you go before us, you go beside us, and you go with us. In Jesus' name. We're going to now, um, I'm going to pass over to Esther, who's going to lead us a little bit further on our journey around what is 40 days of prayer going to look like for us as church. So I'm handing over to Esther. Good morning, everyone. My name's Esther, and this is my friend Rupert. You might remember him from last Sunday. Um, so last Sunday, me and Rupert, we shared with you something very exciting that we're going to be doing starting on the 8th of November. We're going to be um, committing to 40 days of prayer. And as I shared last week, that is a specific response to what we feel like God is saying, what he's inviting us into right now. Um, and I shared a little bit of uh, some of some verses from the Bible um, that we've shared to do with our vision over the last few years. Um, shared also a little bit about a story of Elijah and Ezekiel and some dry bones, hence Rupert. Um, so yeah, we're going to commit to 40 days of prayer. And 40 isn't a magic number. It's not the kind of deal where you pray for 40 days and you kind of like get all the points and all of your prayers are suddenly answered. But there is something significant about the number 40 in the Bible. And yeah, maybe you could have a chat with someone you know and find out those bits in the Bible where the number 40 crops up. But to be honest, it just feels like a good number because it's going to involve a bit of commitment. It's a challenge, but hopefully doesn't feel totally impossible. And this, this morning we're going to have a think around um, when we pray and what that looks like. So we're going to do that now. I'm going to give you one minute and I want you to come up with as many different ways, places, times that you could or that you do actually pray. So if you're watching online, maybe you might want to share some of those on um, social media. If you're watching in person, then say some of that stuff out loud. Um, or just, yeah, have a chat with the people around you. So you've got one minute, have a think of all the different ways and places and times that you can pray. Go. Great, thanks for that. Lots of good ideas, I'm sure. Um, so if we're going to pray for 40 days, like we're going to have to get a bit creative. Like praying, it's not just about being really quiet and having your eyes closed, although it is sometimes, obviously. Um, 40 days is quite a long time and we might get a bit tired. We might forget. So me and my buddy, 
Rupert, we've come up with a few little ideas for you of how maybe you could pray in different ways over 40 days. You could pray when you wake up and before you pick up your phone. Maybe it's, your house is really busy and it's hard to find some peace and the only place that you can find that is when you're in the bathroom. So maybe you could pray when you're in the bathroom. Maybe you could pray when you're traveling somewhere, driving in the car, on your bike, having a walk, um, doing some exercise. Yeah, just whenever you're on the move, maybe you could have a little pray then. You could also pray when you're outside in amongst God's creation. And so many other different ways and places you can pray. When you're listening to music, maybe when you're drawing, colouring in, making something, or even when you're playing a musical instrument. And maybe you set a reminder on your phone or you set an alarm for a specific time of the day to remind you to pray. So maybe that's when you're eating, um, when you get home from school, uh, maybe when you make yourself a cup of tea, maybe when you feed your pets. Uh, lots of different reminders that you could set when you do something specific to remind yourself to pray. Or maybe you decide that you give something up for 40 days and when you would usually do the thing that you give up or think about it, that is another reminder to pray. So maybe you give up um, social media or something to do with your phone, Netflix, or maybe, maybe you give up Coke. Or worse still, chocolate. And every time you think of those things, you pray. So many different ways you can pray. So it's really important and really great that we get to do this thing together. And maybe even more so now as we're kind of a little bit more dispersed, I guess, aren't we? Um, so we're going to have some times on Zoom that we can pray together. There will be um, some prayer breakfasts. Um, some stuff in the evening as well. Um, we're also going to have uh, some prayer walks, so where we walk around our communities and pray together. Um, and maybe you want to get yourself a, a 40 days of prayer buddy, like someone that you do it with, that you keep in, co in contact with over that time. Um, so yeah, it's really important that we, yeah, we do it together. And we're also going to be providing some resources so we can help each other in that. Um, there'll be some uh, daily stuff that we put out there, so it might be a, a two minute video, um, something written for you to have a read of, or we're also going to be looking at creative ways of how we can pray. Um, lots of different stuff because we're all different, aren't we? And we all pray in different ways and connect with God in different ways, so we'll be yeah, trying to kind of cover all that as we do it together. So. Let us know if you're going to get involved. Um, it would be really great to hear from you as we start to think about this and take this on. So 8th of November, not too far away now. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to hand over to Ben. Yeah, Father God, thank you that you know each one of us. And yeah, thank you that we're all different and we connect with you and we talk with you in different ways, in different places and at different times. And yeah, I pray that as we take on this 40 days of prayer, Father God, will you inspire us? Um, will you help us to be creative? Will you show us different ways of, um, yeah, praying and speaking and communicating with you? Um, so yeah, will you work in us and through us? And yeah, I pray that this will be a thing that we, yeah, that connects us, that we do it together as church family and we do it with you. Amen. So I'm going to hand over to Ben, who is wrapping up our series in Romans this morning. Morning, everyone. I'm Ben. Uh, I'm part of the church here at Ebby. Uh, and this morning we're carrying on our series in Romans, uh, looking at what do we believe. Uh, and this morning we're in Romans chapter 5, reading through verses 1 to 11. Um, but before we jump into that, I just wanted to quickly show you, <laughs> share with you probably one of the most exciting developments of my uh, lockdown pandemic period, whatever you want to call it, uh, which is this. <laughs> this is a real live actual potato that came out of my garden. Like I dug up 
my garden and there was potatoes in it. Loads of them, in fact. This is a photo from the other day before I cleaned them up. Uh, this was very exciting development. I have no idea what I'm doing with gardening. So I was very <laughs> thrilled when I was uh, digging around in the garden and found out that there was like 30 potatoes or something had successfully grown in there. Um, anyway, I promise that will be of some relevance later on, but mostly I just wanted to share my excitement about it. <laughs> okay, so uh, potatoes to one side for a second. Uh, let's jump into Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Okay, so uh, like most of the book of Romans, it's uh, that's quite sort of tightly packed um, and quite a lot of almost sort of technical language in there. Um, but really, this is a letter from Paul um, where he's trying to um, explain or set out some understanding of how the life, death and resurrection of Jesus uh, turns the whole world on its head and why he believes that this is the fundamental um, act happening, event um, at the centre of life, the universe and everything. Um, and I think that's obviously a massive task to take on uh, to try and explain the central uh, event of the whole life, the universe and everything. Um, and I think sometimes uh, when we look at Romans, it's tempting to feel like this is this is giving a complete answer because this is such a massive thing and we kind of want to be able to get a handle on it. And because the book of Romans feels so sort of um, carefully and technically written, I suppose, there's lots of sort of almost like a lawyer making a case, lots of language like that. Um, I think it's tempting to feel like, well, this, this, but this is the complete answer. If I can just get the hang of this, then I will know everything there is to know um, about how and why uh, Jesus' life, death and resurrection changes everything. Um, and I just want to say before we sort of get too far down that track or too far into digging into any of the particulars, um, I think that is basically almost never true. Well, it can never be true. Um, I think any time anybody wants to tell you that they've got a complete answer to um, to Jesus and to how that changes everything, if they if they want to tell you that they've they've managed to put it all in a little box and tie a bow on it and they can present you the full picture of exactly how this works and this is all you need to know and once you know this then you've got the whole thing down. I think you can always turn around to somebody telling you that and say to them your idea is too small. If you think that you can get a handle on exactly how all of this works, then the idea that you have of how all of this works is too small. And I'm basically 100% confident that that will always be true, that we, we will never, it doesn't matter how long we spend studying it, how carefully we articulate it, we will never be able to um, fully comprehend and express um, exactly what Jesus does and how that works. There's just so much going on and it's so transformative of absolutely everything and it's just from realms of like logic and understanding that are way beyond our ability to comprehend. There's just no way 
that we would ever be able to fully get a handle on all of it. And so if anybody tells you that they have got a handle on all of it and here it is and you just need to get this one thing and then it's all sorted, just say to them, your idea is too small. And I'm sure that will always be true. And so all we ever really get in Romans or any other bit of the Bible or any other bit of our understanding, the best we can hope for really is sort of one facet of one fraction of the totality of what this stuff covers. That This is such a um, transformative and everything covering story event however you want to describe it that every time we look at it every way we try and get a handle on it everything we try and understand about it um the best we can do is one one way of looking at one bit of it you know there might be one aspect of jesus's life death and resurrection that we can hold up to the light at one time like looking through a, a diamond and we can sort of see through that one angle of it at one moment in time um, but the idea that we can ever comprehend and hold the whole thing in our heads at once, I think our ideas will always be too small. And so this bit of Romans, the whole of Romans, is, is no different to that. Um, this is never going to be the complete answer. But what we might be able to get is um, one piece of the picture. Uh, and I think the Bible is pretty open about that. Like the, if, if anybody tells you, yeah, but you, you have to just get the biblical answer and then you'll have the whole thing. The Bible itself... Um, is pretty open about the fact that it doesn't have the whole answer. So John, at the end of the book of John, he writes that Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So by the Bible's own admission, we don't even have a, a tiny percentage of all of the things that Jesus did. If, if they'd all been written down, there wouldn't have been room for all the books that would be written. So we know that we don't have all the information even. Um, and Paul writing elsewhere in his letter to the Corinthians uh, talks about how now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I only know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So we can't get the full, complete, total, tied up with a bow, got it all sorted, all locked down, understood every last bit of it answer. We can't have one of those. It's just not possible. Um, the stuff that Jesus accomplishes is too big. But I don't think that means that we should therefore uh, give up on the idea of being able to know anything about it. And uh, that's what made me think of my potatoes. <laughs> uh, because so I don't really know. I don't know how this happened. There's something. There's some is photosynthesis, something like that. Like there's something to do with the sun and the rain coming in from the outside and the nutrients in the soil from the inside and some cells in there so like something happens uh to turn an old dying potato in the mud into six or thirty brand new amazing ones that i can eat for my dinner There's like I, i've got some vague idea of of how that growth happens but i don't have the full i don't have anywhere close to the full answer um I think even if I'd done a PhD in biology, I wouldn't be able to have the full, full answer. There's always more mysteries. One of the things, other things I've done in lockdown is start watching lectures on quantum mechanics. I don't know why. Uh, and you just realize that there's so many things that we only have a partial understanding of. But uh, that doesn't mean that we have no understanding or there's no reason, there's no hope, there's no point in in. Um, looking at those things. And so even though I don't know exactly every last detail of, of how a potato <laughs> grows, I know enough to work with. I know enough to know that if I put some of them in the ground and wait, <laughs> basically it turns out that was all I needed to know in order for it to to work. To, it, I mean, it did feel like magic when I was digging them up. But the point is, I, I don't have the full understanding, but I've got enough to work with. Um, and I think that that is true of uh, any time we're trying to understand bits of the Bible. But I especially wanted to give that sort of note with Romans, because I feel like sometimes it's tempting to think that our Romans spells it all out for us. It, it doesn't. Nothing can. But like every other piece of understanding that we can get to with this stuff, I do think um, what Paul is trying to do is look at one piece of the picture here and to give us enough to work with. So sure, we might not understand the full growing process, but we know enough to make it work. <laughs> um, and so that's what I wanted to spend the rest of the time this morning looking at really, um, is just 
are some of the specific things that I think Paul uh, wants to encourage us to work with. Sure, this might not be the full picture, every last thing we need to know, um, but there is enough understanding of how Jesus changes things um, for us to get on and, and do something with that information. Um, and so I wanted to look at, at three things specifically. Uh, there's tons that you can pull out from pretty much any passage. I just wanted to pull out um, three this morning. Uh, so those three come from these sections. Um, the first one is uh, where he talks about how we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. I think that's one thing that he feels changes as a result of Jesus. Um, then just the next line, we also glory in our sufferings. I think he thinks that's another thing that changes that we can do differently, that we can work with because of Jesus. Uh, and thirdly, this is one of my all-time favourite verses. It's a really um, important one to me uh, growing up. When I was 12, somebody shared this with me on a holiday camp somewhere, and it has just always really, really spoken to me. I think it gets to part of the heart of this mystery that is too big for us to understand about Jesus. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so I think these are three things that Paul gives us uh, that aren't the whole picture, but they're enough to work with, enough to be doing something with. Um, so we're just going to quickly run through each of those in turn. But I think all three of them have something in common, which is uh, this is as a result of Jesus's work. Therefore, this is how this whole passage starts, because of what Jesus has done, these things. And I think it's to do with the fact that this puts Jesus uh, at the top of everything, this 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 reorients our universe with uh, Jesus as the ultimate thing in it. And so I think each of these three things, what they are, are um, overthrown idols. I think they are three examples among many of things that could be um, the central thing that we build our life around, things that could be how we work out if life is good or not, things that could be how we um, choose how to live our lives um, but actually because Jesus is now established as the central ultimate thing in the universe then these three things get replaced at the top of that chain and so the first one uh, I've, I've called um, the powers that be I think one of the things that Paul says changes as a result of Jesus um, is the role of the powers that be we boast in the hope of the glory of God Again, I see we do this before. I don't think the emphasis here is on the word boast. This isn't how do we respond to the hope of the glory of God? Do we boast about it? Are we quiet about it? Do we keep it a secret? This isn't the word that matters. The important bit here is what are we boasting in? Because every, boast, everybody has something to boast in. Um, and I think Paul says as a result of Jesus, we boast, our boast now is in the hope of the glory of God. Um, so... In another, you know, another thing that you might boast in, a sort of uh, another power that you might hold up as your own, might be um, in Jesus' day, Caesar or the empire. We boast in Caesar. He's on our coins. He's on the shields of our armies. He, his is the name uh, that we hold up and say, "I'm on that side." And as long as Caesar is winning, then I am winning. And I think you know, we see this all throughout history. People always will find a team to be on, a champion to go and represent them, a, a power to um, put their hope in. Uh, and Paul says that because of Jesus, one of the things that changes is now our boast is in the hope of the glory of God. It's not in Caesar, it's not in the empire, um, it's in God. And, th and these things can cut both ways. So um, this is about what role do these things have? And uh, I think for a lot of people, um, it can still be things like political powers. And, and you see that both, both ways. So what I mean by that is there are definitely people out there in the world who boast in the strength of the political team that they've backed. And you see that at some sort of like rallies and uh, events and some of the posts you might pick up on Facebook, whatever. You know, people are like, my team, my country, my nation is winning. And that's how I know that my life is going well. My hope, my boast is in this team achieving what they want to achieve. 
it goes the other way as well. Sometimes we can feel um, despairing or like life is beyond hope and that there's no chance of anything being good because the powers that be are not doing the things that we want to do, not acting in the way that we want to see, not representing the things we want to see represented. And we can kind of throw our hands up and go, they're the powers that be, they're the ones with the power. Um, I can't do anything. Either way, it still elevates those powers that be to that that higher status where we work out if our life is going well or not um, based on what's happening uh, with those kind of worldly, political, external powers. Is life good? Is life bad? Depends if my team is winning or losing. Depends if the powers that be are acting the way I want to see them acting or not. But Paul says, because of Jesus, those things are no longer the supreme decider. That is not the thing that has the final word. That is not the ultimate um, determining factor in how life is. Our boast is not in Caesar, not in empire, not in the powers that be. Our boast now is in the hope of the glory of God. Second thing, um, I think he says changes because of Jesus is the role of life circumstances in deciding whether things are going great or not, in shaping um, how we feel about our world. Um, he talks about glorying in our sufferings. Now, a lot of the time, um, I think subconsciously or deliberately, um, life circumstances are elevated to this highest position of deciding whether life is working out or not. It, they become the most important thing. And so the, the, the determining factor in, is life how I want it to be? Is, are my life circumstances how I want them to be? Um, for a lot of the sort of Western world, I feel like avoiding suffering and inconvenience and discomfort at any cost is like the highest good. That is the big deciding factor. Is life good or not? Well, how much inconvenience am I having to go through? How long have I been stuck in this queue? Um, obviously, sufferings can be on a huge spectrum from the trivial to the very serious. Um, but the point is that it's this idea of whether life circumstances are the deciding factor in the quality of our life. Is life good or not? Does that depend on, am I living in the house that I want to live in? Have I got the car that I want to drive? Have I got the health that I hope for? Um, have I got my dream job or not? I feel like a lot of the time those in practice do become the deciding factor of whether life is good or not. But Paul is saying, uh, because of Jesus, then our life circumstances are no longer the final word in anything. Um, and so suffering can come along, um, but that doesn't destroy us. It, life is not ruined beyond repair if there's any suffering in it. There is a chance of glory and hope in the middle of those sufferings um, because the story of Jesus and the life that he offers us is so much bigger uh, than those things that they're not the final word. Um, and so life circumstances are no longer the determining factor. Um, and thirdly, uh, I think he overthrows the idol of our own ability, um, my own ability to make life how I want it to be, to pull myself up by my bootstraps, to um, perform to my own expectations, to not screw up, to get things right, to be a success, to be a good person. Um, Paul talks about how God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he wasn't waiting, God wasn't waiting for us to get ourselves sorted, to have it all sorted out, to be neat and tidy and perfect and flawless and make no mistakes, be a good person, be perfectly kind and loving and to have gotten rid of every trace of sin from our lives before he could come in and say, all right, now you can be in relationship with me. He shows that it's an act of love because it was while we were still complete screw-ups, while we were in the middle of fighting with each other, of being angry and cruel and dismissive and heartless and selfish and all of those things, while we were still deep in the middle of being our most screwed up selves, Christ died for us. God shows that to be an act of love that is not waiting on us to be okay before it can come into action. Um, it was while, while we were a mess, <laughs> while we were a mess, that God shows that he's willing to die 
for us. This is a completely mind blowing concept without even remotely enough time to touch on. But I, I yeah, <laughs> um, I hope that you can see um, why it's so powerful that it was while we were still sinners. Um, and so that overthrows this idea of it being all about our ability to get things sorted, to straighten ourselves out, to perform well, to succeed, to um, be right. Because it was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. It's often tempting to feel like it's on us to pull ourselves up to the place where we can be acceptable to God or even just to ourselves, whatever, whoever we think it is that determines our value, whoever it is that decides whether we are loved or not, whoever's approval we are seeking, it's really tempting to feel like it's all on us to make sure we've done everything we can to win that approval. But Paul says it's God's approval that matters and he shows that he loves you no matter what. So it's not about your own ability, it's about his love. Those are just three things among many that I think Paul is saying they change because of Jesus. Like we can't figure out exactly why and how and the full details of how that happens, but we know enough. We know enough to work with those things. And just one last note um, before we finish. Um, I think that while Paul says that all of those things are massively changed because of Jesus, that they're no longer the most important, they're no longer the determining factor in whether life is good or not, that it's not about how the powers that be are behaving, it's not about whether our life circumstances are peachy or not, that it's not about our own ability to win people's approval. None of those things have the final say anymore. It's now about Jesus and what he's done and his love for us. All those things have been overthrown. They're no longer the most important thing. But it doesn't mean that they're gone doesn't mean that they're deleted, doesn't mean that they cease to exist and have no influence anymore. Um, it just means that they're no longer the ultimate thing, because now Jesus is. And so what that lets us do is to live differently, to live in a different relationship to those things, to have a different power relationship with them, so that they're no longer the deciding ultimate factor. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're gone. And so the powers that be are still there. They might not be the shaping final word in whether life is good or not, but they are still around. And so we can't just wash our hands of it and go, well, I don't need to engage with uh, politics or power or anything. That all seems very tawdry and beneath me. I'm on this transcendent plane of floating above that with God. And, you know, that's, that's all beneath me. It's not the case at all. Um, Paul is saying that our relationship with those things is changed by Jesus, um, but they're still there. And actually, it's really important to engage with them and to show that perseverance and character and hope that he talks about in our relationship with the powers that be. Same goes for life circumstances. Yes, they don't get to be the deciding factor of if life is good or not, of what matters in the world. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not still there. Of course, they're still there. It doesn't mean that we can just say, well, I'm immune to suffering now doesn't mean anything that life can throw at me makes zero difference to me they're not the ultimate thing but of course they're still there and it's important to uh, strive to diminish uh, suffering of those who are in pain to rejoice with those who rejoice to weep with those who weep we recognize um, that circumstances still happen that suffering is still real and painful we're just saying that because of Jesus, it no longer is the final say. And the same for our own ability and our own um, behaviour and character and what we do with the choices that we have. Yes, those aren't the deciding factor. Whether I am a screw up or not is not the deciding factor in God's love for me. I do not need to be perfect to be loved. I do not need to get it all right to be approved and to be a valuable person. But it doesn't mean that my behaviour makes no difference and that I can just shrug it off. And Paul says elsewhere in Romans, should we just go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. It doesn't mean this stuff is irrelevant. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's gone away. It just means that it's not got the final word. Um, the final word rests with Jesus. And that's not a complete picture. I don't know, I can't tell you the full details on exactly how that works, the complete process by which all those things come about. But I think there's enough to work with. And so that's the encouragement really is um, let's do that work um, and strive to live in a different relationship to those things um, to make Jesus the ultimate deciding factor 
um, above the powers that be, above our life circumstances, above our own ability. Um, I think there's enough to work with there. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you that because of Jesus, you have the supremacy and it is your actions and verdict and your love and grace and mercy that wins out. Help us to live with those things as the deciding factor, the biggest picture, the ultimate power in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Ben, for talking to us. Uh, I've got to say, I loved seeing Ben genuinely excited about his garden and what he's been able to do there over lockdown and over the last few months. It's just lovely to see him excited about that. Um, it's important as well for us to remember those things that he's shared to us. I just wonder, in all honesty, how we might be responding in life just now to everything that's happening around us and we're really reliant on the circumstances that we find ourselves in rather than relying on everything that Jesus has done. And I think that's a really important message that Ben has given to us, that actually our reliance is on Jesus and everything that he's done perfectly and wonderfully and not to keep looking at the stuff around us because life is hard. So, yeah, I wonder how we might respond to that. But actually, there is an opportunity now to respond. As I said earlier, we're going to join together on Zoom. Click on the link. I mean, it's on the website. It's on the catch up alongside this showing. And uh, just join us because we're going to share communion together. And that's always a great way to respond to what we've heard. So I hope you've got something prepared uh, for communion, but I hope you can join us. It'd be lovely to see you. Now, God bless you all. Uh, hope to see you again next week.